blue lines. But there is a black moment. Okay? They all share the same moment pointing perpendicular to the plane. So this is very interesting. There's no uh, orange line. So that's, we found a flexure element that just resists a moment. That's really weird. Right? Before, I, I, I remember there, there used to be a time where I thought that um, all flexure elements have to at least contain a single blue pure force line in it, right? That's, remember, we usually use the fact chart that just has only pure force blue lines in the constraint space. Um, and I thought there was no way you can get a physical spring that doesn't, uh, you know, resist, um, you know, that, that, or let's say it this way, that could only resist a pure moment or only resist a pure wrench. And uh, this proves it wrong. This one would, this could not resist any forces. It could not resist any wrenches, but it can resist a pure moment. And so it's, it's very interesting. Okay, and there's a bunch of other ones that do that. And we'll also design one that just resists a pure wrench. Okay, so um, we're, we're going to start getting into how do you generate serial elements. We know how to generate parallel elements. Uh, you know, I gave the rules for that in a past lecture. So how do you generate serial elements? Well, you might think, well, just design a serial system and then shrink its intermediate stage or stages or bodies, right, the intermediate ones, um, to points, lines, or curves. And that would be fine. You know, sometimes that can work. If you just want to design a serial system, then take all the intermediate things and shrink it to point, lines, and curves, you're, you're golden. Um, but the problem is, is there's a lot of serial systems where you can't just shrink their, their intermediate bodies to a point line or a curve. So, for instance, take this one. Remember we designed this one? This is a serial system. Here's the ground. Here's a blade to intermediate rigid body. Here's the blade to the final stage. And we, we, we synthesized that um, as a flexure coupling, which means it basically can achieve any, ro any motion except a rotation uh, through its axis here. So I don't like how I drew this. I said a rotation with a big X through it. It's better to show the degrees of freedom, right? And, and, and it would be a rotation here, a rotation here, and translations in all directions, okay? Um, and so, um, so, okay, so we got that. So you say, well, what if we want to turn that into a serial element? This is a serial system, obviously. It's got an intermediate rigid body. If you drew the schematic of this, you'd have to draw rectangle, parallel spring, rectangle, parallel spring, rectangle, right? That's a serial system. Well, can we shrink this guy to a point, line, or curve? Well, let's try Let's say we shrink it this direction and we get this. Well, what ends up happening? I mean, you can't make it disappear because they're not even connecting, right? So you can only shrink it so far and then finally this becomes a blade and now you've got three blades in series and instead of it getting five degrees of freedom, it now adds a degree of freedom and this is now six degrees of freedom. So we just change the degree of freedom. This would no longer be a good flexure coupling because it couldn't pass the moment through. This one would do torsion. Okay, so, okay, so we, can't, we can't do that. This is a serial element version of that, but it's, it's not kinematically good. It's wrong. It, it, this, this, we shrunk it, and this has a different freedom space. So can, what, what if we shrink it this way? Well, then the two planes will overlap and collide, and, and, it's, it's, and these will fuse. And it's just you can't shrink this to a point, line, or curve. So my point is, um, and there's actually quite a few of these examples here. First of all, before I make my point. So see all these things labeled A. This is a nub flexure. You know, we, we've seen all these before, except I don't think I've shown you this one. This one's just kind of a living hinge as well, just like that one. Okay? So these are all parallel elements. And you could say, well, let's just stack these parallel elements in series. So you can see S1 is this one stacked two in series. Uh, S2 is E2 stacked in series. This one we're familiar with. We stacked this in series, turned it 90 degrees took this one, stacked it in series, and then, then stacked that one in series a bunch more and a bunch more. Uh, and then we took E5 and stacked it in a bunch of weird series on this entire row here. And you'll see we got a bunch of serial systems by doing that. And they, they all have a bunch of, you know, these are parallel elements. We stacked them in series and we got serial systems where they all have a bunch of intermediate rigid bodies. Well, the question is, can we just take those intermediate rigid bodies and shrink them to a point, line, or curve and do away with them and call them serial elements? No. These are all examples of ones you can't do that. If you, if you shrink this down and this now becomes a wire, that'll have a different, um, 
it, you know, that, that, that's, that's kind of a different system, right? Um, so uh, even though technically it would have the same freedom space, but, um, but it, would, it would not be the same thing. It would, it, you know, like if you took this and shrunk this down to something different to a wire, it would now, um, you know, change its, uh, you know, it, it would change its uh, system as, as well. So, so it, the, the point is you can't, there are some things you can't change, like get rid of. Like, for instance, this one's the intermediate body. The most you could shrink it to is something that looks like this that's like a nice flat sheet here. Okay, and, and you can't, well, or you could cut the corners off and it's a diamond, but you really can't, Joint, you can't you can't get rid of them to a point, line, or curve. Is is my point? Some of these you can you can try and shrink them, and and they'll re maintain the same freedom spaces, right? As 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 what what you get by leaving the bodies there, but but like they're they're fundamentally different things, right? And so so these are these are examples of systems, you know, in B, where you can't get rid of the intermediate bodies. They can't be shrunk to a point, line, or curve. Okay. So, so my point is, is like, yes, if you want to design a serial element, you can design a serial system and then try and shrink all of its intermediate bodies to point lines and curves. And if you're lucky, it'll work and you'll have a serial element that does what you want and, and good for you. But it's not a foolproof approach because as I've shown you from this example and all these examples in B here, um, they can't be, sh they, some intermediate bodies can't be done away with, it can't be shrunk to a point line or curve, okay? And, and they'll always have an intermediate body that's a mass that needs to be modeled and can vibrate around and could be under constraint. So the question is now, how do you synthesize serial flexure elements, okay? A foolproof approach, okay? So let me, let me just give you the, kind of overview of this, this section. So uh, remember when we synthesize serial systems, we pick the freedom space we want and we break it into intermediate freedom spaces and we do that because we can count, we can know right away from intermediate freedom spaces if the system that we're going to synthesize is going to be under constrained or not because the degrees of freedom in each added together better be equal to the degrees of freedom of the initial freedom space so that you know we know it's not under constraint and we can control that and that's what we care about because it's a serial system that's going to be intermediate bodies and so again the process is you take a freedom space break it into intermediate freedom spaces check if it's under constraint going to be under constraint or not and then find their constraint spaces and synthesize the parallel modules stacked in series okay so that's what you would do if you're designing a serial system where you're going to have rigid body intermediate freedom space or sorry intermediate rigid bodies and you want to check if they're um, under constrained or not and, and probably preferably make sure they're not under constrained and they don't have redundant degrees of freedom they'll vibrate all around and you don't really care about how if you can shape those any way you want you're going to be able to join your parallel systems together so so you know joining them is not an issue well when we're designing serial elements you know, you could use that approach, but you wouldn't be able to check for under constraint. And we don't care about under constraint with serial elements, right? Because serial elements can't be under constraint anyway, according to theory. I mean, like I said, they can in practice exhibit some under constraint issues. But remember, in theory, serial elements by definition don't have intermediate rigid bodies. So they, they can't have bodies to have redundant degrees of freedom. And, they, and they, therefore, they can't theoretically be under constraint. So therefore, you don't care about controlling under constraint when you're synthesizing elements. So why even consider the intermediate freedom spaces? Okay? Instead, what you care about is making sure that the parallel elements you're joining can be joined at points, lines, or curves. And to do that, you can visualize that much easier using intermediate constraint spaces. So the approach you use to synthesize um, serial elements is the following, okay? Um, okay, and I'll repeat myself a number of times because this is a little confusing, okay? Um, so first step is pick your freedom, degrees of freedom you want, right? Which is the first step for a system as well. Um, in this case, we're going to do a crazy one. We're going to do like a, a rotation, rotation, two translations. They're all perpendicular, like on the x and y axis. Or, um, or so, yeah. 
and, and then on the z-axis you have a screw with a pitch p, some specific p. Okay. Well, the second step is to find the freedom space, which is this big mess of you know, um, yeah, this is the linear combination. This is all this stuff. And its constraint space is just the single um, orange line with a Q that equals um, uh, the negative P. You can prove that from P plus D equals tan theta. Um, or sorry, yeah, yeah, P plus Q equals D tan theta. Um, y you, can, you can prove that uh, the wrench that is complementary to these guys will, have, will equal the negative of the pitch that you want, okay? Okay, so, so fine. So, so again, say whether we're designing a serial system or an element, you, you start with the degrees of freedom, find its freedom and constraint space, okay? Now, if we were designing a system, we would break this into intermediate freedom spaces, and we would use that to check if it's under constrained, and then we'd find the constraint spaces and just join them with any shapes, intermediate stages we, want, we need to join them. Okay, and the reason, like I said, you would do that is because you care about under constraint with serial systems, and you don't care about joining them because you can join them with any intermediate stage. But for serial elements, we're going to take the constraint space, and we're going to find other constraint spaces in the fact library that um, intermediate constraint spaces that contain this constraint space. And we're going to stack those together and visualize how they would join at a point line or curve. Now again, with this approach, so select intermediate constraint spaces that contain the wrenches within the system's constraint space. By using this approach, you can't check if it's going to be under constraint or not, but you don't care because it, it's not going to be under constraint for sure because it's a serial element. It doesn't have intermediate bodies. Okay, But using this approach, you can make sure these things join at points, lines, or curves. And I'll show you how. Okay, so say you take this uh, constraint space. Let's look at, and by the way, for designing, you know, hybrid and serial elements, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's very handy to look at the entire mathematically complete fact chart, okay, that I, I, I introduced to you some lectures ago. Okay, find this guy's constraint space, a single wrench here is in the 5 duf column, is right there. And what you do then is you want to consider, uh, if you're making a serial element, you want to find all the constraint spaces to the left of it, okay, that contain it and lie within the parallel pyramid. Okay? The reason it's important it lies within the parallel pyramid is because you're going to be taking these intermediate constraint spaces and, and you need to be able to generate parallel elements from them to stack in series. Okay, so so again. We're not finding constraint spaces that lie within this. We're finding constraint spaces that this lies within, which means it's, it's all the bigger constraint spaces to the left. Okay? And they're all within the parallel pyramid so that you can use those constraint spaces to, uh, you know, to, to um, generate parallel elements that are stacked in series at points, lines, and curves. And again, um, you, know, you can look up in past papers you know, I have a list, you know, for this one, um, all, you know, you can look up all the freedom constraint space pairs that contain this orange line in it. Or this is very easy because you can just look at the ones to the left in the parallel pyramid and say, does this have any orange lines or this any orange lines in it? Nope. This one does, so that works. These don't have orange lines. All these other ones do. All these ones do and all these ones do. So those are all your options. Let's pick um, a, a simple-ish one, okay, that's going to produce a very interesting geometry. Um, this one, you might not think it's terribly simple, but it kind of is because you can see not only does this have a circular hyperbola that's blue, but it's got a disk of wrenches and then a, a, a single wrench right up its center. Remember, it's basically taking um, this uh, uh, cylindroid, take its principal axis and rotate around its principal axis, and these two blue lines, extreme generators, will make this. That's what this picture is showing. Um, okay, but, but the one you rotate on the principal axis, that's this guy, and these are the principal axes of the other ones rotated, right? So let's just take this one, and we can see that this nice, clean, vertical one lies within there. So we're going to take it, make sure we tune the geometry so the Q is the Q that we want, okay? And... Um, and we're going to uh, stack it on top of itself, 
So we make sure that this single line with the same Q is common between this one and this one. Okay? And, and so as long as it's common between the two, the only thing that will exist and be common is that one now, right? Because remember, if, you're, if we were analyzing this, you know, and, and we, we said the constraint space of one of the parallel elements is this, the constraint space of one of the parallel elements is this, find what's common between the two, that would be the constraint space that persists. So what we're kind of going backwards here where, you know, you want to find intermediate constraint spaces that contain this, therefore to the left of them, um, that are in the parallel pyramid, picking as, you know, the number that you pick determines the number of elements that will be stacked in series. So in this case, we're just going to pick two because you don't want to overly complicate it. We're going to pick one that's relatively easy to find what's common, and you stack it in series and make sure this one's common and has the same Q. And then you use those constraint spaces because they're in the parallel pyramid. Um, they've got your blue spaces from which you can synthesize your circular hyperboloid flexures and just make sure there's not, you know, this is thin enough that, that, that there's not the other regulus of, or, or ruling of, of lines um, that fit in it. So it's only one, one of the rulings of the circular hyperboloid fits in it. Okay, and you'll get one that then sure enough achieves just a pure wrench. Okay, but before I talk about that, let me, let me go back here. So, so let, me, let me just, <laughs> it's, it's really confusing, but let me, let me summarize here. Um, okay, remember, serial systems, you find the freedom space, break it into intermediate freedom spaces, check if it's going to be under constrained or not using those intermediate freedom spaces, and then use the constraint spaces and synthesize parallel systems stacked in series. Okay, why do you do it that way? Because serial systems have intermediate rigid bodies, um, you care if they're under constraint or not, and you can tell that from intermediate freedom spaces. And intermediate rigid bodies can be shaped any way you want in systems to join those, so that's not an issue. Okay, but when you're synthesizing serial elements, you don't. You, what you do is you take the freedom space you want, you find its constraint space, and then you find a bunch of other intermediate constraint spaces that contain that constraint space. Um, within them and make sure they're in the parallel pyramid, arrange them so that uh, they, they share only that one in common that you want, the, the main constraint space, a and also make sure you align them so that when you synthesize the elements, they can join together at points, lines, or curves. In this case, it's joining at a nice curve here, okay? But a point would be a bent blade or a bent, bent wire at a, at a point and a bent blade would be a line, okay? So, Join the points, lines, and curves. Then the whole thing will be able to deform over its geometry and it will be a true serial element. Okay? So again, the reason we do the constraint, intermediate constraint space route, which is admittedly more confusing than the intermediate freedom space route, is because we don't care with serial elements about under constraint because they're guaranteed not going to be under constraint because there's no rigid body in between to even have redundant constraints or mass to vibrate in theory, right? But what we do care about is visualizing whether they can connect, connect at points, lines, or curves. Okay, and you can visualize that better with intermediate constraint spaces. Okay. Um, okay, so this guy is, is a pretty remarkable um, flexure element, okay, because it, it doesn't achieve a force at all, it doesn't achieve a pure moment at all, it just achieves a wrench with a special, a special Q. Okay? And, um, Right, and so, so, um, uh, and so, so, um, its order of constraint is just one because it only has one constraint space, and it's got, uh, you know, five degrees of freedom. Okay, and um, you can actually make it a little bit more symmetric about itself if you kind of. So here, here's an example. I mean, this is a crazy system. If you take one of these take an identical copy of itself, rotate it so it kind of twists within itself. So you can see here's one, here's the other, and they're, they're kind of like right on top of each other. So they actually have redundant constraint, okay? Um, you might want to do, if you're going to use this, you might want to always put two kind of on top of each other so that they have the same constraint um, so that they're a little more symmetric and do their job a little bit more you know, without parasitic error and issues. Of course, the downside is, is they'll be over-constrained. Okay? 
But, um, but anyway, that, that's what's going on here. But, but this, was, this is an interesting freedom space. Um, say you wanted to design a system where it, it can translate in any direction, right, like x and y, you know, in the xy plane. But in the z-axis, it, it has just screws with certain pitches. Um, you would see, let me see if I can go back to, um, the freedom space of this would be this. Okay, so if you wanted to design that, this is a very interesting freedom space. If you have a, a, a screw and two perpendicular translations that are perpendicular to the screw, they will linearly combine to make a disk of translations and a box of screws of all the same pitch, which is a really, and it's oriented like this, so you imagine all these green lines coming up out of there, which, which is really interesting. I mean, you, you could visualize that moving with the, the translation, but imagine now if I push Anywhere I push on that top thing, it will not only translate, but it'll rotate around my finger. No matter where I push, that's a really weird flexure. Imagine pushing on a tabletop, no matter where you push, as it deforms down, it rotates about your finger um, with a very specific pitch. That's a weird freedom space. And so I wanted to design it. And um, you can see it does have a constraint space, but not one in the parallel pyramid. So it's got to be done with a serial or hybrid system, um, and so, so what we what we did is we chose you know three wrenches, in, in, you know its constraint space is a box of three wrenches and moments, but you can make it in an exactly constrained right way by taking three wrenches that are um, have Q values that are the negative of that pitch, and are, are not all on the same plane. Okay, and that's essentially what we did here. You can see there's three wrenches that are all parallel to the green one, and they'd all be the exact same Q, because they're all the same kind of geometry, and it w would be exactly constrained, except for the fact that um, uh, we put them in their pairs to over-constrain them. We did this job twice. So if, if this one, this one, and this one were not there, and you had just done three of these, it would have been an exactly constrained system. Okay? These in and of itself, of course, has to be exactly constrained. They're a single element. Um, and if we had just done three of those, it would, the whole thing would have been exactly constrained. <clears throat> um, and, and, and uh, you know, but, but the parasitic errors would have been bad. So we, we added this one kind of in, intertwined with itself to over constrain it and did it for all three, so it's three times over constrained. But it would make it much nicer. And maybe if you wanted even nicer, maybe you'd do four of these at like the corners of a square table or something. And now it would be symmetric and you get this nice, um, uh, you, you'd see the weird uh, freedom space in motion. So I thought I'd share that just because it's, a, you know, you, no one could intuit how that would move or design that without fact. That would be very strange. So you can see that the level of bizarreness you can get to here in what you can design. Okay, so now we're going to talk about, I'm just going to give you a library of useful serial elements. Um, Okay, so again, there's nothing comprehensive about this, but it's a nice reference. You can use it. Um, of course, I've given you the tools now to, 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 to go through the whole fact chart and for any design you're doing, synthesize the appropriate um, serial elements uh, to get whatever you want and consider all of them. But if you want to be lazy and not have to go through these processes and synthesize it in your head, you can just refer to this library and just kind of use these as kinematic equivalents. Um, you know, like the trick of every time you see a wire, replace it with a bent blade and stuff. So, so this is just kind of to help you, but this is by no means comprehensive, okay? So everything you see on this page, and some of these may look very familiar, except the top two left ones, um, these are serial elements um, that achieve no degrees of freedom, or sorry, no degrees of constraint. So they, 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 have, they provide no constraint. They're just six degree of freedom systems. Serial elements with an order of constraint of zero, which means six degrees of freedom. So um, if you wanted to make a six axis positioner and you, you didn't want to really constrain any of the directions, but you want some stiffness and, and the precision of the bearings to get six degrees of freedom, you could use any, any of these. Um, and there's, there's many more of them, right? Okay, um, 
the top row here, these are all uh, wire kinematic equivalents. Okay, and I, I didn't show the stacked blade in series. It's really useful. But, um, but by the way, that stacked blade um, series, you know, let's go back to this. It's a good point. Here is the stacked blade. This is, this is a system, right? It cannot be made into an element, okay? Because you can't, you can't shrink this intermediate body to a point, line, or curve like I, I already told you. It, it, the, the closest you can get is a diamond kind of, uh, or a flat plate or a flat plate shape like a diamond connecting them. That's not a point, line, or curve. So this, this guy cannot be made into an element. None of these can be, okay? They, they are, by their nature, serial systems. Okay, whereas these, this is a library of, of uh, elements, okay, that deform over their entire geometry, okay, um, and can be joined at points, lines, or curves. So these all have order of constraint of one, the top row, and they all can be swapped out for a wire, okay. Some of these you can see are kind of ridiculous, though. Um, right, so, so it's like maybe don't use those, okay. This one's a good one. Um, these are some very interesting ones that just achieve a pure moment. Um, you know, and they all look really weird. You wouldn't expect any of them um, because, uh, you know, just constraining a moment is something I don't think anyone knows how to do, really, um, uh, because you really need fact to, to design uh, elements that, that can just purely kill a moment, um, you know, have a moment as a constraint space. And, and, and no other pure forces or wrenches, okay? Um, this is the one we looked at before. But you can imagine this, this design, remember, remember this design, the, the corrugated thing that was just straight up and down got a constraint space that was a box of, of uh, blue lines with a disk of, of, of uh, you know, perpendicular moments. Well, if you take that and you put all those boxes along here in kind of series, and ask what's common between them, you can find the only thing that's common will be this moment. Okay? And uh, this one, you might think, well, that looks like a hybrid element, but it's not because, remember, if you schematically draw it, this is, would be a serial system, but it's, it's shrunk to points, lines, or curves. Okay? Um, and so, so uh, right, so this would be a serial element. Same as that one, okay? Okay, so, um, okay, um, so this, these ones are guys with orders of constraints of two, and they achieve this uh, constraint space. So anytime you have this constraint space, you could use those serial elements, okay? Anytime you have, this, the, these are designs that are serial elements that achieve a pure moment, a blue force, and a wrench. Okay, and remember this one, I told you it's not just a single blue line, it's also a moment and a wrench. Okay, so those three have the same constraint space. This one is an interesting uh, constraint space serial element that's just a disk of blue lines. Okay, um, so some, some interesting geometries. Okay, th this one has an order of constraint of three in this constraint space. This one's an order of constraint of three, has this... Uh, uh, you know, that constraint space, um, and is very, very interesting. This one, by the, consequently, would, would be able to achieve that freedom space uh, from the trick question when I first started talking about constraints where you had to add a wire uh, to, to kill a certain degree of freedom while allowing the other motions, and it was like a trick question. You couldn't do it. You could do it with this one, and it's really weird. <laughs> okay, so this is a single serial element, okay? Um, this one has an order of constraint of four, and this one's order of constraint of five. This one's interesting because you can think about it. If the angle between these two, this one and this one and this one and that one, if, if the angle between those had been the same so the, the, the blade just kept going through and it joined at that thing, it would be a, it would, it would, um, 